Hello and welcome to another episode of the Construction Corner Podcast. I'm Dylan. I'm your host. And as always, guys, if you get anything great out of this, please share with a friend. Today, we're going to be talking about uh, really the construction industry as a whole, what we can do to improve, and how research and development is critical to your future success. So after having been in the industry for a decade plus now, it's and done $750 million plus worth of projects, leading design teams of electrical guys, MEP teams doing healthcare, um, schools, hospitals, industrial projects, you name it, you know, I've been a part of it. And over all those years, and now looking at Fortune 500 companies, um, both that are listed in construction, right? So publicly traded construction companies, engineering firms, as well as some of the bigger firms just in the world, right? The Amazons, Alphabets, Intel, Google, right? All those companies and looking at what they spend in R&D uh, really got me to thinking. And Matt and I brought it up on a couple of shows and I want to kind of dive in here a little more on this episode, why research and development is uh, crucial, right? And you can call it a lot of things. Some firms might call it um, like innovation team or uh, process improvement or anything like that, right? But ultimately, we're trying to find out ways to improve our processes and how we do things more efficiently. So I looked up the Fortune 500 companies, and on average, they invest 5% of their revenue into research and development. The top three uh, R&D sectors are communications equipment with 16.9%, uh, internet services with 17.95%, and software with 19.35%. Uh, the top firms are Amazon, Alphabet, Intel, Microsoft, Apple, Johnson Johnson, and General Motors, right? Those are the top R&D spenders. And then construction and engineering as a sector is near 2%, right? Less than half of the average investment in research and development. And why do we start with these statistics, right? First, we got to know where we are, right? Like how much are you as a firm spending on research and development, on process improvement, on systems, right? Like in anybody dedicated to processes. Let's start there, right? <clears throat> so because if we're going to talk about technology, the future, and how construction lags and productivity and profitability, then we need to look holistically at what highly profitable companies are doing, right? And then we can figure out how this all can be achievable for us in the construction field. So how do you manage to take 2% of revenue and put this toward R&D, right? We're just trying to go to the S&P uh, standard or the publicly traded company standard of research and development. So... One way that this can be done is simply as having one person dedicated to process improvement. On the engineering side, and really the architecture engineering side of things, this is not a BIM manager, right? Your BIM manager is usually working on production, on getting projects out the door, on your Revit upgrades. They're like half IT guy, half um, just things break in Revit, and they're the go-to person. This is not that guy. This person is dedicated to really figuring out process improvement. They're dedicated to figure out how softwares work, which softwares to vet, which projects to try them on, to test them in sandboxes, to go through processes and checklists and total process improvement. That's what this person is dedicated to. Now, if they make a $100,000 a year and just say weighted, they have 125, so $25,000 worth of benefits, right, in some way, shape, or form with healthcare, social security tax, like all the taxes on that employee. Let's just say weighted, they have $125,000 salary. So <clears throat> with 2%, that goes to $6.25 million in annual salary expense. So your firm would need to be doing at least that, probably $7 million in uh, revenue, probably $8 million in revenue a year uh, to dedicate one person making 125 grand or 100 grand uh, to this R&D position. And for a small firm, that's a pretty big chunk of money to put towards somebody to do this. But just know that if they find a 2% improvement 
right? 2% across the entire firm, they've paid for themselves. If they find 4% improvement, then they've basically been profitable. They're, they now become a profit source for you. If they improve by 10%, where you don't have to now hire an extra person, they've more than covered their spot space, right? So that's the way to think about this on a return on investment. And for firms with smaller revenue numbers, right? Say you're doing less than 5 million in revenue. This might look like a half a day on Friday for one or two of your guys to get together to allocate some time to process improvement, right? To figuring out processes and they spend, you know, four hours on a Friday trying to figure some of this stuff out. Those might not happen every week, maybe they're every other week, um, but it's to try to put some investment toward process improvement, right? Whether that's building checklists, building training, building uh, embedding softwares, right? All that type of stuff go into what an R&D kind of budget and allocation can look like. So when you have a person dedicated to it, as we've already mentioned, they're able to vet new softwares, review processes, put together training plans, and more importantly, work on that software to integrate it into your current and existing processes. So that when it's rolled out, there's really all the, the big kinks, the bugs, the how this should work have been worked out so that when it gets rolled out across the firm, it's integrated pretty smoothly and effectively into your workflows, allowing adoption rate to increase. And then you to actually see those productivity gains from implementing the software within your firm. So kind of a simple and common sense thing that doesn't often uh, get implemented or it's overlooked as a whole, right? Hey, this there's this great thing. And then you go to try to implement it. There's like a few little kinks to work out and you don't have a power user to really train the rest of the firm on. Well, that's what this person can be. And they can maybe train your BIM manager on it to then easily allow them to roll it out across the firm. So as much as we want to talk about technology, process improvement and innovation, we have to start with culture, right? The culture of trying new things, the culture of rolling out new products, using new tools, using new technology, and a culture of testing and innovation. And if you never do any of this, then you'll never be more profitable. You'll never be more productive. And so if we want to change how we view all of this in construction, then we need to ultimately come to the point where we learn to try new things and ultimately having somebody to do that while, again, the average engineer is working on you know, maybe three to seven projects. They don't have time to dedicate to new innovations. So you do need somebody that's dedicated to these new things so that they can test it, vet it, and then roll it out across the organization once it's ready to be implemented uh, in the firm. So at the same time, right, because people are working on so many projects, they're only going to work so many hours in a given like time span, right? So people as a whole don't have a problem necessarily working overtime for a uh, given amount of time, right? Say a few weeks, a month, maybe. But then after working 60 plus hours for a month or two on end, people can really get tired of that. And they're going to burn out. They're not going to put up with it anymore. And they're going to look to go somewhere else. So especially with the salaries that we have in the a &E industry. Now, people will go years uh, at firms like on Wall Street and whatnot when they're making... 500 grand, a million dollars a year, like you, you'll put up with it a little more and a little longer because of how much money you're making. In the Indian industry, we don't have that luxury. We like people aren't going to kill themselves for 100 grand a year. So, a culture of innovation really has to be there for this to take place. A culture of looking for every little way to improve. And whether it's templates, meeting minutes, checklists for projects, Revit content, you know, there's hundreds of ways to improve your processes and productivity across the firm. You just have to be constantly looking for them and the type of firm to implement these things uh, at every level of the firm, right? If a technician finds something that uh, helps productivity, you implement it. If an engineer does, you implement it, right? Like it doesn't matter where it comes from so long as the idea is good and vetted and then implemented within the processes. So there are firms that have taken this approach and you see them gaining massive market share, right? They are the DPRs, the AECOMs, the Skanskas, the Turners of the world where they are investing in new technologies and new processes 
and they have teams to vet and roll these things out. Um, now, by the very nature of the business that we're in, like trying out a new methodology, a new system, will take kind of six months to fully vet, right? You're going to try it on a project, go through a full project life cycle, see how it works, and then kind of implement it from there. And so this is where like that discernment process of which softwares, which solutions, which things to test and vet uh, becomes really crucial in the whole decision-making process because you're going to waste um, six months either way, right? Whether it's a good and actual investment or uh, six months of like, uh, we learned and better luck next time, right? And then you go, you have to, even if it didn't work the way that you wanted to, you have to go and try something else on a next test to see that it works. So you can't get discouraged after the first um, project doesn't go the right way with a new set of software. And this is where a lot of people kind of throw the baby out with the bathwater is a test doesn't go well, a new technology doesn't work the first time, and they kind of just toss the whole thing out uh, the window and not come back to it. So the more projects that you have, and it, usually these are done on like smaller projects that, you know, things can be recovered by hand or using the old way um, if it doesn't go the way that you want to, right? So if you're able to apply a test every six months, that means you can make two improvements, potentially, you know, big improvements a year. And if each of these improvements is only 5% of the company at large, then you just made a 10.25% uh, improvement in a year, right? The first one's five, the next one's five, they compound on each other. So it's 10.25%. Um, and that that's not a small improvement, right? So with this, like, this is why a dedication to improvement is so important. And it's the only way that you're going to guarantee that you'll improve is to be dedicated to improving, right? Makes sense. Because even if you invest in the tools that we create, like here at Calabunga Studios, um, if you don't have the culture to reinforce their use, then you'll never succeed. And I've seen it like name a tool out there. And there are those who dedicate themselves to using it, figuring out and how to leverage it. And those that founder, right. Never putting any time into that tool. And this goes for like Revit, you know, just a plain base piece of software. There are people that have really invested time in learning the tool, maximizing its use and people that uh, can barely function with it out of the box. So I really wish there was an easy button for this whole like software innovation uh, mindset. But then again, if there were <laughs> an easy button for this whole thing, everyone would be doing it. And because not everyone is doing it, it means that it's worth doing. So big mindset shift there, right? Because not everyone is doing it, it means it's worth doing because it's going to be, you're going to get exponential gains basically out of it because you can do more projects, you can take on more work and more work means more accolades, more projects means more in your portfolio, more in your portfolio means you can go after more projects and the whole cycle continues. So take some solace in the fact that by your very nature of listening to this podcast, of trying, of caring, of being here, of doing the right thing, of being the type that innovates, that you're going to be ahead of the curve. Just remember that you have to be diligent and keep at it because if you don't, then who will? Until next time.